Good evening. On behalf of the Class of 2013 Class Council, I would like to welcome you here tonight for this very exciting event. My name is Kaylee Duggan, and I am a senior physical therapy student, a member of the Student Government Association, and the Senior Class Council. <laughs> when I think of this Class Council, I go back to our freshman year planning our first confidence campaign. Through the confidence campaign, we promoted loving yourself, body, body mind, and spirit. This theme of self-empowerment has carried through our entire four years at Simmons. Last year, as we, plan as we were planning our senior year events, our class council decided we wanted to leave our mark forever on Simmons as, as it has left its mark on us. <laughs> Simmons is a place that is dedicated to supporting its students. Many of us have always dreamed of bringing someone big to Simmons. Tonight's event is a culmination of over a year of work and support from many people across the college. Simmons College consistently works towards social justice. Over the years, we have seen how our values as a class parallel the values of Simmons as a whole. We see Simmons students changing the world through initiatives like the Simmons World Challenge, the Gender, Justice, and Social Entrepreneurship Conference, events like Take Back the Night, <laughs> conversations led by our Like Minds Coalition, and much more. Simmons is a place of tradition and values. In 1972, Margot McDermott and Nina Balsam drew up a petition requesting that Gloria Steinem would be invited to speak at their 1973 commencement. Forty years later, Shannon Curran, president of the class of 2013, had a vision to bring Ms. Steinem back to our campus. Our class council wanted to bring someone who meant a great deal to us and to Simmons, who shared our values, and who appealed to the Simmons community as a whole. When we thought of who this should be, we knew that Gloria Steinem was our perfect fit. In 1973, the Simmons Voice stated, what is perhaps most significant about the work of Gloria Steinem, the real person, is the degree to which all of her endeavors have been directed at justice for all people, and not the turning of one group against another. This too parallels significantly a deep commitment of Simmons College. Gloria's message is as relevant today as it was 40 years ago. The class of 2013 would like to welcome you to this exciting night at Simmons. Now please give a warm welcome to President Dryden. Thank you, Kaylee. Well, it's wonderful to have such a full house this evening. And as Gloria welcomed the students and their guests in 1973, let me welcome you as friends and sisters. So friends and sisters, it's a privilege to welcome all of you here for, during Simmons College's celebration of Women's College Week. A Simmons tradition honoring outstanding women leaders, past, present, and future. On behalf of the entire Simmons community, I'd like to thank everyone who took part in making this e event a reality. So, that would be particularly the class of 2013, in collaboration with the Office of Student Leadership and Activities, the President's Office, the Alumni Association Executive Board, <clears throat> excuse me, Simmons, Palooza, and the Office of Advancement. We'd like to also thank all of our friends, students, faculty, staff, and guests who are here with us this evening. It brings me great pleasure this evening to share some remarks about one of the most influential feminist advocates of our time. Tonight, Gloria Steinem will present the F word, feminism today. This is a particularly apt time for Ms. Steinem to speak with us. This spring marks the 40th anniversary of her receiving the first Honorary Doctorate for Human Justice, awarded by the college at that year. She also delivered the commencement address to the graduating class of 1973. Many alumni of that class are here with us this evening. Ms. Steinem's life work demonstrates a commitment to values embraced by Simmons, the pursuit of excellence, gender equality, the advancement of women, diversity, inclusiveness, and investment in community. Ms. Steinem is a world-renowned writer, 
lecturer, editor, and feminist activist, with particular interest in gender and racial equality. She co-founded Ms. Magazine more than 40 years ago and also helped found New York Magazine. As a freelance writer, she has been published in Esquire, the New York Times Magazine, Glamour, and many more. She is a best-selling author and her works have appeared in many anthologies and textbooks. <clears throat> As a writer, Ms. Steinem has received numerous awards, including an Emmy Citation for Excellence in Television Writing, the Lifetime Achievement in Journalism Award from the Society of Professional Journalists, and the Society of Writers Award from the United Nations. Ms. Steinem has founded or helped found countless organizations which promote women in leadership and politics, which support children's education and human rights, and which combat racism. These include the National Women's Political Caucus, Voters for Choice, the Ms. Foundation for Women, and Take Our Daughters to Work Day. She was also a member of the Beyond Racism Initiative. Ms. Steinem graduated Phi Beta Kappa from Smith College in 1956, and then spent two years in India in a Chester Bowles Fellowship. She wrote for Indian publications and was influenced by Gandhian activism. She has been recognized for her work by various organizations. Parenting Magazine selected her for its Lifetime Achievement Award in 1995 for her work in promoting girls' self-esteem. And Biography Magazine listed her as one of the 25 most influential women in America. In 1993, she was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame in Seneca Falls, New York. She has been the subject of three biographical television documentaries, including HBO's Gloria, in her own words. I'd like to comment on how important it is for Gloria Steinem to join us here at Simmons today and what this means to our community in thinking about where we were just 40 years ago when she gave the 1973 commencement address. <clears throat> the 60s and 70s were a period of great political and social unrest. It was also a period of great reform in our nation and here at the college. Women's roles specifically were beginning to shift from housewives to businesswomen, from caregivers to providers, from passive participants to vocal leaders. In her commencement address, Ms. Steinem discussed gender and racial inequality and the caste systems which enabled these disparities. She called for action and change and noted that Simmons women were contributing to advancing the landscape. Reflecting on Ms. Steinem's 1973 address begs the question, how far have we come? How has Simmons helped move the agenda forward? As a contemporary of Ms. Steinem's, my answers to these questions emerge from living through the amazing culture clashes which burst forth in the late 60s and early 70s. Images of those days appear before us on the screen as distant memories. But for me, each evokes a life experience as palpable today as it was then. Woodstock and the challenge to social norms of every kind. The first walk on the moon, remembered forever with the footprint of one human being. The agony and terror of Vietnam a war that tore apart families, cities, and institutions in the United States as well as in Southeast Asian nations. Protests and political upheaval never before seen by our parents' generation, now warmly remembered as the greatest generation for their unquestioned service to the United States in a previous era. People we still know today icons with faces a bit smoother, and actions which moved worlds in their time. And a very most simple reminder of the emergence of the women's movement, the removal and the frequent immolation of one simple piece of women's clothing, the bra. <laughs> Yet in the 40 years since Ms. Steinem has visited Simmons, this is the backdrop I have 
the benchmark I use for thinking about how far we have come. In my own lifetime, as a new teacher, I have hidden a pregnancy, if such a thing is possible, from my principal, who would have had to fire me if either of us had acknowledged it. I have served in the Peace Corps in what was called a non-matrix spouse position, that is, a nobody in the eyes of Peace Corps management because they established that my husband was the volunteer and I was his companion. In fact, they actually told me that they thought of me like a pioneer woman who would have followed her wagon train leader husband across the hostile plains. I have worked multiple jobs at lesser pay than my male colleagues, and in one case actually figured out how to get that fixed. Over a three-year period, I doggedly sought a role in the Foreign Service, which I learned about in Ms. Magazine, only to be shut down all three times. Thirty years later, I was part of the largest class action suit ever won against the, against the U.S. government for discrimination against women. And as the senior human resources executive of a healthcare system, I have taken on the power of the Catholic Church to protect the women in the organization from a CEO who was a serial sexual harasser. Seen through the lens of where we started, these events may seem predictable, maybe inevitable. But they do not tell the whole story, because while these very real events occurred as recently as just before my becoming president of Simmons College, they are surpassed by some wonderful experiences, including being named the first female executive at the oldest continuing banking concern in the country, that is, the first woman in 200 years, winning high professional accolades for creating great workplaces, raising three wonderful adult children and remaining married to my high school sweetheart for 45 years while working full-time throughout our lives together. being chosen by both my undergraduate and graduate schools to sit on their boards, and the highlight of my professional life, being named the president of Simmons College. <clears throat> so my experience tells me that we have made a lot of progress, that progress is not necessarily linear, and that we have still a long way to go. I truly believe people of goodwill will help each and every one of us along the way, and that we must all be as generous as possible in offering our helping hand. I see serious impediments to continued progress, but I know such has always been true, and the work of the feminist revolution continues. As I have said before, I see Simmons as a beacon of leadership in American higher education, a resource to our nation and the world, and a global expert in educating women for their own empowerment and for leadership. From the beginning of our being, Simmons has encouraged us to be in the world and to make a difference. Continuing to live our mission has stood the test of time and is our true north. It is vital that we hold our place hold our values, and continue to create opportunities for women to live their very best lives. Once again, I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the hard work and dedication of our student leaders, particularly the class of 2013, and the Office of Student Leadership and Activities in bringing Ms. Steinem back to Simmons. Please join us, Gloria. Are we going to have a great time tonight, or what? <laughs> First of all, I want to thank President Simmons for that introduction, not of me, but of her. 
It is so important to speak personally, to tell our stories. And you did that in life this evening and inspired all of us because of it. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Now, I was very touched, as you can imagine, when I received this invitation. I travel around the country a lot. It's kind of like reading a novel. I go back to the places I was 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and find out what happened. <laughs> so to be able to come back 40 years later is an amazing life experience. But now I am much more moved to be here because I have spent the day meeting you. So I have some idea of the great hearts and great minds that are in this audience. I already knew President Drynan was here and Barbara Lee, your illustrious alum who is putting people in office all by herself. And then I spent the day meeting the Department of Women's and Gender Studies, uh, Girls Leap Self-Defense, Swag Center, the Simmons Institute for Leadership and Change, Strong Women, Strong Girls, Vision 2020, uh, Student Government, Tierra for Student Government, uh, the Like Minds Coalition. So I have some idea <laughs> of who's here. So I have asked special permission uh, to not just talk at you, <laughs> but to have an organizing meeting, right? So to have a question and answer so-called time, but not just, well, give me answers. I could use some answers. <laughs> but also to make announcements of upcoming troublemaking meetings that you think this group should know about. Um, to uh, actually, if you'd rather not say it, any, if there's anything you'd rather not say, pass me a note. I'm going back to New York right after the lecture, so I'm willing to read anything. <laughs> uh, and, and truly, to uh, try to turn us here into a circle. It, it doesn't make sense to me to have this kind of structure. I know we must because of our numbers, but to have a hierarchical structure with you looking at each other's backs and me looking at you, hierarchy is based on patriarchy. Patriarchy doesn't work anywhere anymore, including in the <laughs> So, so I, I've, I've asked special permission. Uh, yes, I will speak for a while to give us something shared to respond to, but then we're gonna turn the lights on so we can see each other and become a circle in this room. Because now, just as 40 years ago, we are gathered together in a group that could never have happened before in exactly the same way and will never happen again in exactly the same way. So my hope is that all of us can leave here with one new idea, one new phrase, one new f companionship from meeting each other in this space, uh, something that makes our lives more just the next day and the next. Um, now, you know, of course, to be chosen by you, the students, is the greatest honor of all. So I want to thank you for um, dwelling in the land of the future, but being willing to take a chance on a golden oldie. <laughs> uh, though I plan to live to be 100, uh, I did begin my life in the land of personality books. I bet there's, a, do you know what a person, it, it was the predecessor of Facebook. It was, it was like a secretarial handbook and it had your name on it and then people wrote in it things like, cute but knows it. <laughs> um, 
I started in the land of mimeographing instead of just pressing send. Uh, and we only got tattooed if we had had way too much to drink. <laughs> if you're lucky enough to grow old, this will happen to you too. People younger than you won't know how to type, and they will talk in tweets, uh, and they will have no idea of what change a light bulb means. So I just want to spend a moment suggesting two things. It is the content, not the form, that matters. So whether it is with a quill pen and sprinkled with sand, or whether it is a tweet, it is the content that matters. Also, I feel I should say to you that getting old is a very weird and truly great experience. I worry that you now have to, you now think you have to be a success before you're 30 or so. And I'm glad you're planning ahead in that way because planning ahead is a measure of your feeling of power. We thought in my generation that the needs of husbands and children would take over and therefore we could not possibly plan. You see it in all ways, this phenomenon. Rich people plan for generations forward, poor people plan for Saturday night. Our sense of control of time is really very crucial. However, neither giving up control of the future, as I did, nor trying to control it and dictate success allows us to live in the present which is the only time we can truly be full alive, fully alive. And about the age thing, I just want to say that we have to change the culture so that your generation can truly enjoy aging. For one thing, I can testify to some of its greatness. All your old lovers become your family. The crazed possessiveness goes uh, because if you ever liked or loved each other, you always will. Also, aging should be a special pleasure for women because our bodies dispense with what they need to support another person and keep what they need to support us. How great is that? <laughs> No wonder happiness in all studies turns out to be a U-shaped uh, graph. That is, we are happy when we're children, then we are least happy in the center of life, and then as we get older, we get happier. And this is true of both women and men in, different, in all cultures in varying degrees. And I think the problem with that down area in the center of life is that it is when we are most expected to conform to norms, especially gender norms, and that interferes with our happiness. The problem is that, especially for women, we are valued as the means of reproduction. As Marx would have said if he'd listened to his daughter, and so we're devalued more than men with age, though men are also devalued. It's fair to say that in the world generally, females are valued more for our wombs than for our brains. In this country too, our bodies are valued more as ornaments than as instruments, more for how, what, how they look than for what they can do. So all of this is only a scintilla of the reason that we're here tonight to discuss the F word, feminism. But we should say right away that not everybody has to use one word, right? There are other terms, women's liberation, womanism, girls with several R's, which I love. The word feminism 
because it is the most popular, has been demonized by the Rush Limbaugh's of the world, who call us feminazis. Uh, it has been distorted, and for the most part, if you send somebody just to the dictionary, it's no longer the F word, it's a word of pride. It does just mean the belief in the full social, economic, political equality of males and females, and I would only add acting on it as well as believing it. Now, the good news is that this image of feminism begins to change when you look at the real poll results on who does and doesn't call themselves a feminist. At a minimum, more women self-identify as feminists than as Republicans. They never tell you that part. <laughs> um, and this has been true. The difference between perception and reality has been true from the very beginning. For instance, there was a massive Lewis Harris poll in 1972 called the Virginia Slims Poll, I'm sorry to say, because that was who sponsored it. Uh, and it showed that about, uh, 30, about a third of white women self-identified as feminists or women's liberationists, and twice as many black women as white women so identified. This is the opposite of a media image which gives the ownership of the women's movement to white women. This has never been accurate. I learned feminism from the women in the National Welfare Rights Organization, from Florence Kennedy, from Eleanor Holmes Norton, uh, from so many women who, having understood the caste systems based on race and themselves being more subject to the discrimination of the labor force and so on, were always pioneers of the movement and ahead in the movement. So don't let them tell you who, actually, I think the public image of a feminist, do you think she's married or not? I'm not sure, but white married women are the least likely to be feminists. And if the Virginia Slims poll had had the wit to cover other women of color, in addition to black women, it would have been even more pronounced. Now, it's interesting that in 2012, uh, another poll, was done of voters of everyone who voted in the last presidential election or a representative sample of those voters. And it turned out that 55% of all women voters self-identified as feminists without a dictionary definition, nothing, just self-identified. And because now we're getting smarter about polls, 30% of male voters identified as feminists. Again, it was contrary to the image because younger women were more likely to self-identify as feminists than older women. 58% of younger women voters versus under 54% of older women. Of course, there was a huge gender gap. We know that. If only men had voted, even including black and Latino men who voted hugely for Obama, but even so, white men would have skewed the outcome so that if only men had voted, Romney would have won by 52 to 45%. And Elizabeth Warren would have lost without her 12% gender gap. So this consciousness change is making a huge difference. Indeed, so many men now self-identify as feminists, that we have stopped talking about the gender gap and begun to talk about the feminist factor when we talk about our election results. So if we think about uh, where we were 40 years ago, where we are and where we're going, I think we begin to see that we were just establishing terms 40 years ago 
and we are now beginning to apply those terms universally instead of supposing that they are only tied to, to one group. Now, this still leaves us in a place of great danger because one of our two great political parties has been taken over by anti-feminist extremists. And it's important to understand that these folks who are extremists are not necessarily Republicans. There is almost nothing left in the Republican Party platform with which most Republicans agree. Nixon supported the Equal Rights Amendment. Goldwater was pro-choice. Reagan was both of those things until right-wing uh, money went to him and said, you have to change when he was, when he was governor of California. It, it's, it's important to understand that this is not representative of Republicans. It's part of the reason there's so many independents now because people have despaired of the Republican Party and begun to leave. It, those of us uh, who are old enough will remember that Jesse Helms started this trend by objecting to the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1964 and changing from, becoming, from being a Democratic senator to being a Republican. I always feel I have to apologize to my Republican friends for all of the <laughs> Uh, 8,000 fundamentalist Baptist churches, Jesse Helms, all the folks who used to be Democrats but now have, in protest of too much inclusion in the country, become taken over the Republican Party. This is enormously dangerous for one of our two great political parties to be in the hands of extremists because, of course, when we are upset with one party, we vote for the other without necessarily looking at the content. But I must say that in this past election, it, the, the degree of insane uh, anti-feminist statements about rape, about, uh, you know, you all lived through it, right? <laughs> right, right. Is, um, certainly galvanized the vote for us. And now I see that the Republicans are in full soul, the Republican Party, is in full soul searching. Unfortunately, they are still discussing how they sold themselves, not what they are selling. They haven't changed positions so far, but at least some great um, change seems to be afoot. And what we need, I think, is to subversively take back the Republican Party. I think that women would be well suited to do this, don't you? We could put our dresses and our pearls and we could go to the precinct meetings. <laughs> It, it's the way they took over before the right wing. We could do it again, you know. In four years, four years you would have a bloody convention, in eight years you'd have a pretty good convention. <laughs> and it would once more be a centrist party. But what, whatever happens, I hope that you don't say to your Republican women friends, how can you be a Republican? You know, we would not respond to that either. <laughs> but simply say, look, the party left you, you didn't leave the party. So let's just think about the issues and vote on the issues. But I think if we saw in that, the past, the present, I think that the future really is a larger understanding that we cannot have democracy without feminism. It is simply not possible. Now, we are constantly also being told that the movement is over, right? And this is the new form of, of opposition. I mean, the same folks who used to say to me that you can't possibly do this because you're going against nature, you're going against God, you're going against Freud, you're going against something. I can testify that sometimes it's the very same people who are now saying, well, it's over. You've succeeded, this is all you could possibly want. So remember that that notion that it's over is just a form of resistance. Because the truth is, if you look at precedent in the past in history, if you look at the abolitionist and suffragist movements, it took them 100 years at least 
to gain for women of all races and men of color a legal identity as human beings and citizens and voters, a hundred years. That was legal identity. Now we are striving for legal and social equality. So it is not surprising that it will take another hundred years. And we are barely 40 or 50 years into it. So I don't know how to break this to you, but I think <laughs> we have at least 50, 60 years to go. Uh, and before, finally, it is without question the case that citizens are citizens, human beings are human beings, and the gender prisons that cause uh, men to be, uh, n not to be loved unless they win, and women not to be loved unless we lose. Uh, the gender police, you know, will have lost, I believe, and we will finally be uh, see, understood to each other as unique human beings. Two things, each of us uniquely human, because the truth is that the differences among us and between us based on race or gender or class or ethnicity or sexuality, those differences are less than our unique individual differences. It is the uniqueness of each person and the shared humanity. It is those two things that I think we will realize. I've been hearing today about your inclusiveness on this campus, your understanding of the need to be individual, unique human beings to each other. And that is so, so, so important. As Robin Morgan has pointed out so beautifully, hate generalizes, love specifies. And that is the uniqueness of each of you here. So I've been trying to think about future, about past, present, and future in sort of eight different areas. We'll see if I get to all eight. If I don't, we'll just have a discussion instead. Okay. <laughs> um, but I think that uh, we started out understanding, finally, uh, in the beginning years of the movement, the feminization of poverty. We came to understand why and how women were impoverished and that it was not natural, it was unfair. A wonderful woman named Diana Pierce, who is probably a hero of social workers here, in 1978, and who is still an expert on poverty, coined the phrase, the feminization of poverty. What we have realized now in the present is the masculinization of wealth, that you can't solve the feminization of poverty unless you attack and understand the masculinization of wealth. That can be in every way from unequal pay to unequal inheritance, uh, think of the amount of concentrated inherited power in this country that almost always goes to the son, not to the daughter, or if to the daughter tied up in uh, trustees and so on. The, um, the control of great centers of, of wealth that is passed down from male to male as part of the masculinization of wealth. It, it is... Um, you know, once in an editorial meeting in Ms. Magazine, we, because somebody had told us that women slept their way to wealth and power, we said to ourselves, well, by any means necessary, let's make a list of people who have done this. <laughs> and what we found were women who had maybe slept their way to good dental care, a nice house. <laughs> but what we found were actually the people sleeping their way to power were sons-in-law. Because families, you know, without, with the misfortune not to have a son, would look for a son to run the business. And, you know, it was amazing how often, as soon as the father-in-law died, the son got divorced, and he took it with him. We figured out that the collective value 
of all of those family fortunes being taken off by sons-in-law far exceeded any alimony and child support payments you know, being, being given uh, after marriage to, to women. So you know, we really need to think about the masculinization of, of wealth. I think too, we've begun to understand that um, poverty is not a victimless crime and that it has criminals, it has perpetrators, uh, such as the Koch brothers, such as Walmart. Uh, I, I noticed that Elizabeth Warren uh, said yesterday that the, minim the minimum wage, if it were corrected for increased productivity of workers, would now be $22 an hour. And so she deducted the seven, some, you know, which is, it really is the minimum wage, and she said, intelligently, who took the other $14.25? Right, I think we know who, who took it. Uh, and therefore, we think about the 1%. In this country, we see how profoundly divided we are uh, ec economically. Now, the, that is the present. What could the future be? Well, we of course will continue to pursue equal pay. If we only had equal pay now of women equal to men doing the same jobs, we would have, I think it's $14 billion more in the economy every year. And every white woman would get a hundred something dollars more a week, and every uh, woman of color would get three hundred dollars and something more a week. Um, and this would be equal pay alone would be the greatest economic stimulus this country could ever have. We tried to keep saying this during the last election because they kept talking about economic stimulus, but there was this division, you know, women's issues equal pay is separate from the economy. Hello, we are the economy. <laughs> um, but in addition to equal pay for what is already recognized as work, that is revaluing work, we need to redefine work because a third of the work that is productive work in this country is caregiving work. It is done 90% by women, but sometimes by men, in the home, raising children, taking care of elderly parents, taking care of invalids. It is indispensable to the country. Uh, it is literally a third of the productive work in this nation, and it has no economic value whatsoever. None, none. Yet, you know, it makes no sense. We can't plan economically unless we make all the productive work visible. But we could do something about this. Teresa Funicello of the Welfare Warriors, a woman who became an economic theorist from being on welfare and is now a genius <laughs> economic theorist, has pointed out that we could uh, ass assess caregiving work at replacement value, not difficult to do. I learned from President Drinan today that to replace the average homemaker would cost $47,000 a year. Right? So we assess uh, the, um, the value of the homemaker's work, of the caregiver's work, at replacement value. We make that tax deductible if people pay taxes and tax refundable if they don't, thus substituting for the disaster of welfare reform and we have won the principle of deductibility. So this is possible. This is possible. It's not hard. You could do it with tax policy. You wouldn't even need a separate piece of legislation. We could go from uh, a simple, uh, f from the argument that women don't need equal pay and so on, that we're working for pin money, to real equal pay and in the future to the, to economic valuing of all productive work. We could go from, we could go from the decriminalization of abortion and birth control, which has been terribly important, 
You know, one in three American women has needed an abortion at some time in her life before it was legal and after it was legal. The difference is injury and death to the women who need those abortions. So yes, it's crucial that we decriminalized abortion and birth control, even though we see before us now the backlash against it. Uh, and we finally establish reproductive freedom as a basic right, a basic human right, like freedom of speech. And that means reproductive justice. It means the freedom to have children in safety, as well as the freedom not to have children. It is um, so crucial that we establish this. You know, whether or not a woman can decide when and whether to have children is the single biggest element in whether she is healthy or not, educated or not, able to work outside the home or not, and what her life expectancy is. It is at least as fundamental as freedom of, freedom of speech. And that is what we are trying to establish now, nationally and internationally, whether it is wor women working against female genital mutilation in other cultures, or it is doing the work we are here. It is all about establishing reproductive freedom. I think the future is bodily integrity. I think, you know, the, the, all the issues of, of uh, involuntary testing, of pressure to, you know, give or sell donor uh, organ transplants and so on, all the, all the things that have to do with bodily invasion and that affect many men as well will eventually give us beyond reproductive freedom, the principle of bodily integrity, the understanding that the power of the state stops at our skins. Um, I think also um, we, we understood from the beginning because of the uh, knitting together the uh, inspiration of the civil rights movement to the feminist and every other social justice movement, the fact that the abolitionist and the suffragist movement came to, we understood that the caste systems of sex and race uh, were intertwined, but I don't think we understood exactly why. We knew they came together, but we didn't understand why. Now we understand that the only way you can continue racial separation or class separation or ethnic separation is to control reproduction. So the, what happens is that the so-called superior women, whatever that means, are uh, restricted in order to maintain racial or class or ethnic purity. They are kept on a pedestal, but as a black suffragist said to her white suffragist sisters, a pedestal is as much a prison as any other small space. And they are restricted while women of color, the bodies of women of color, are exploited in order to produce more cheap labor. And both, the suffering is different often, the cause of the suffering is the same. So it's become clear to us, I think, now, and will become more clear in the future, that it's not just because most women are, I mean, women, we come in all different shades, sizes, ethnicity, you know, everything, so naturally feminism should include everybody. But it is also that the ability to maintain racism requires sexism. And so there is no such thing as being a feminist without being an anti-racist, it just doesn't work. And there's no such thing as being an anti-racist without being a feminist, that these two caste systems are intertwined and can only be fought together. Now, sometimes on campuses, people ask me things like, how come the same groups are against both birth control and lesbians? <laughs> huh? 
and it does sound a little, but <laughs> the fact is that they are the same groups. Why? Because their position is, which perhaps they also got born into, I don't know, the, their position is that all sexuality is immoral and should be condemned unless it can end in conception. So naturally, they're both against abortion, contraception, and love between members of the same sex. And this is, you know, this is a lie about human sexuality. We, we, we don't seem to have periods of heat or estrus in which our sex, sexual urge is focused as other animals seem to, though I'm always worried I'm a, you know, maligning other animals when I say this. Who knows? <laughs> <with> the, <laughs> But sexuality, I mean, human beings can experience the same sexual pleasure whether we can conceive or not. So it has always been a mark of our, our, our humanity, like our cerebral cortex, our ability to reason and remember, not just to think, but to think about thinking, <laughs> which, you know, our sexuality is a mark of our humanity because it is not only a way we procreate if we choose to, but also a way we reach out to each other, we communicate, we express love and caring. And therefore, uh, it, it is sexual expression is not all about procreation, but we have been systematically lied to for century upon century upon century to tell us that it is. The, um, uh, the sexuality movement, I say this because sometimes I worry that our adversaries understand why our movements are connected better than we do. And we still sometimes see ourselves in silos too much. You know, this is the women's movement, this is the civil rights movement, it's the gay and lesbian, transsexual, transgender, you know. And yes, it's very important that we each have our own identity and our own voice and that we name ourselves, that's crucial. But it is also true that we are connected to each other. And I don't want to, the future to be a time in which we, our adversaries know that better than we do. Um, I love to think about words, don't you? I mean, it's fun to think about words. And I've realized that um, you can always tell politics because the superior group gets the noun and the inferior group has to have an adjective. So it's a woman poet, or it's a black doctor, but it's a guy, it's a white guy, he's a poet, he's a doctor, you know, he doesn't need an adjective, right? Um, it was true even when I was growing up in East Toledo, <laughs> which was the bad part. It was, you know, Toledo was the good part. Um, and I was thinking about this uh, because uh, a guy on a plane sitting next to me when we'd been on the tarmac for like three hours or something, they were giving us a movie to pacify us, right? So he said, okay, but no chick flicks. I thought that's interesting. There are movies and there are chick flicks, you know? <laughs> so the superior thing has taken the noun. And then I thought, but actually, we know what a chick flick is, right? It has more dialogue than special effects, more relationships than chases, <laughs> more about how people live than how they die. <laughs> but this poor guy has, is having to say in the negative what he wants, why shouldn't he be able to have an adjective like we do and he could have prick flicks? <laughs> we know that prick flicks are all the movies that glorify World War II. You know, I think they have spent more money on movies glorifying World War II, which was the last time we could be both violent and right, <laughs> than was spent on World War II. <laughs> All the movies that glorify violence against women, preferably young, half-naked women, all that insist female human beings are the only animals on Earth who seek out and enjoy pain, um, and we maybe could expand this from, and if there's chick lit, we could have prick lit. <laughs> Philip Roth. <laughs> Brett Easton Ellis. <laughs> I'm sure you'll come up with a great list. 
But eventually, in the future, I hope and believe we are going to be in a place where we just have good and bad movies, doctors we trust or we don't, writers we love or not, but we don't insist on adjectives. Now, I, I wanted to add one current one because, uh, you know, this is something we need to lobby on right now because it has to do with immigration. And the, this, we have to look at every issue as if women mattered, right? So in immigration, women really do matter because it happens that 75% of all immigrants are women and children. But the image we see in the media is more uh, a migrant worker who's a man, or a drug dealer who's a man, but we, we don't see who immigrants really are. And we don't understand that they mostly come for domestic and service work in the informal economy. So we are now putting together in Washington legislation that says that you can only become a citizen if you have a work record. They don't have a work record. It's not the nature of the work that they do. And so they are not as likely to be eligible for citizenship. The, and it's interesting to me that we put an emphasis on allowing people to come in for high-tech jobs, which we actually need much less than uh, the home care category of worker needs are increasing exponentially as our population ages, and yet we give the male mostly male job, high-tech jobs, preference in immigration and not what we actually need more in this country, which is help with health care and home health care. Uh, we make citizenship dependent on learning English, yet it's much harder for women to learn because the classes are at times when they're home with their kids because they're on community campuses where you have to have some English before you start for all kinds of reasons. There's less asylum for kinds of persecution that women suffer, from female genital mutilation to femicide. It was, we fought for those in the 90s, but we have been losing those categories. And if you want to see how ex exclusionary our immigration policy is and what we have to lobby on and take, be careful about, you can see a wonderful article in Color Lines by Pramila Jayapal about this. Um, we are moving towards democratic families, I think. We are beginning to understand that you can't have a democracy out there unless you have a democracy in the family, otherwise you normalize hierarchy. Um, and we are beginning to name and define violence against women in all of its forms, from domestic violence to sex trafficking. We're beginning to understand that pornography is not erotica. Porne means female slavery. That's what it means, it's in the words. And it's about domination and pain, erotica, eros, love, mutual free choice, mutual pleasure is often quite different. In fact, we now have t-shirts that say eroticize equality in order to <laughs> try to take back sex from the pornographers, right? Um, so, and finally, I just wanna say that we are beginning to realize that this is not separate, this is not siloed, this is not an adjective to a noun. This really is the whole ball game. I brought along a, a show and tell here, which is Sex and World Peace by Valerie Hudson and four other scholars, which demonstrates with great uh, credibility and readability, I might add, that with a hundred modern countries, that the most, uh, the biggest indicator of whether a country will be violent or is violent within itself, and domestic, you know, in the streets, guns, all of it, uh, and whether it will use military violence against another country, is not, is it poor or not? is not natural resources or access to them, is not religion, is not even um, degree of democracy, it's degree of violence against females.
that that is what that is what normalizes all other violence. Not because female life is more valuable than male life, no. But because of the systems of patriarchy plus racism plus all that we know that, that inflict violence on females are the first we encounter. We encounter them in everyday life. We call them, what hap we say what happens to women is culture. What happens to men is politics. What happens to women is culture. No, what happens to women is political too, right? But it is buried in, the, it buried and made to seem normal to varying degrees in, in various countries. In this country, for instance, um, if you added up, let's see, if since 9-11 you added up all the women who have been murdered by their husbands and bo or boyfriends, and then you added up all the Americans killed in 9-11 in Afghanistan and in Iraq, the number of women murdered by their husbands and boyfriends would far exceed the cumulative toll of those uh, Americans killed in those three events. And this is still a why didn't she leave, blame the victim, just as sexual assault is. I mean, we, we need deeply, deeply to understand um, the role that violence plays in policing the gender roles, in controlling reproduction, in beginning the first step of every form of hierarchy to come. So I hope that um, we begin to see that there's a lot to do. <laughs> so I went back and I looked at my uh, graduation speech and I see that 40 years ago I said, we are talking about a deep and anthropological revolt against the caste systems of sex and race, against all those systems that divide us up. I just want to say to you from the bottom of my heart that when I said that, I had no idea <laughs> how true it was <laughs> or what it meant. I really, I, you know, people say the longest journey in the world is the journey from head to heart. And I think that's true. You know, we intuit things and yet we don't deeply understand them for many, many years. So I'm just beginning now to understand what this means. I'm beginning to see at last that we are linked, not ranked, that original cultures were built on the, the for 95% of human history, our cultures were built on the circle, not the pyramid. And we are now striving with, in every way in our great social justice movements, in the environmental movement, to understand that we are not separate from the environment. We are beginning, we are striving, striving to come back in a new way to the kinds of circles and understanding that we had in the past. And that was the paradigm for 95% of human history. So, um, at least, uh, we're beginning, right? We have, uh, I'm so glad that we have women's history, African-American history, gay and lesbian, it's all remedial history. One day we'll have human history. How great is that? <laughs> One day we'll start history when people started, not just when patriarchy, nationalism, and racism and other stuff started, which is what... One day we'll study a lot more about Africa than Europe because Africa is much bigger. <laughs> um, we have a lot, a lot to do together and I just want to say from the bottom of my heart and the last 40 years that you are going to have such a good time doing it. It makes everything else boring. It is the basis of everything. Uh, and what else? Well, God may be in the details. We should pay attention to details, I agree. But the goddess is in connections. Thank you. Are the... No, thank you.
Thank you, Ms. Steinem, for providing us with new... You have to say Gloria. You can't okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Gloria, for providing us with new insight on how feminism has evolved throughout the decades. You have opened our eyes to the many facets of feminism and have given us all a lot to think about. I would now like to transition to the question and answer portion of tonight's event. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Molly Meadman, and I am a member of the Class of 2013 Class Council. Prior to Ms. Steinem's keynote address, our Class Council asked members of the Simmons community to submit questions to be asked during this portion of tonight's event. We received an overwhelming number of responses, and from those, we have chosen a select few questions to ask Ms. Steinem tonight. It is now my pleasure to introduce Terry Vung, a member of the class of 2016, to ask the first question. Okay, but I'm going to do my best to answer short, which is not okay. the thing I do best, the, uh, so that we can maybe get the lights up and have uh, an organizing meeting, too, and you can tell me answers. Ah, great, there you are. Oh, I'm so glad to see you. <laughs> Hi, um, my question is, having been so successful, um, has any of your writing ever oh. been rejected? And if so, um, how did you take in those? How, have, I, I'm what sorry, I missed, the, I, it's a oh, little okay. reverberation sorry. here. Can you start again? Um, having been so successful, is, has any of your writing ever been rejected? And if so, what have you taken from those experiences? What, has any of my writing been rejected? Oh, so, how long do we have? <laughs> what have you learned from that experience? <laughs> um, well, on the good side, for instance, I mean, one of my earliest experiences was that I wrote a long article about the contraceptive pill for Esquire, and they told me that I had made, I had done the incredible feat of making sex boring. <laughs> And it was true, I'd fall in love with the, you know, technicalities of it, you know, and not the human impact of it. So uh, in, that, in that case, it was very, very helpful. You know, it, it, it was important, you know, the human brain works on narrative, not on generalities and statistics, so it was, it was very, very helpful. Um, other times, uh, it just, it wasn't helpful, and so I just took it somewhere else. I just tried to stick with it. Thank you, Terry. I would now like to introduce Anna Sarneso, a second year graduate student in the Graduate School of Library and Information Science to ask the next question. Hi. In light of the recent media reaction to the Steubenville verdict and the resistance met in passing the Violence Against Women Act, it seems that one of the greatest challenges that feminists are faced with today is our country's rape culture. As a successful activist who has affected great change within culture, what advice do you have for young women and men who are looking to take action against rape culture and victim blaming? Mm -hmm. Tell stories. You know, it, we do, our brains are organized on narrative and we do empathize with each other the, every issue that I know of came up through people telling the truth about the stories of their lives. So if we say rape culture, that's very important because it's broadening the issue, I agree. But we need uh, individual stories. And we can see from what has happened in India, which has profoundly, profoundly changed that country, and now they have put the United Nations definition of, of, of trafficking into legislation because of the woman who was murdered uh, by being obscenely raped with an, with an object, right? And, and we see on our campuses, you know, what, is, what has happened. So I, I would say tell stories, and I would, real stories of real women and girls, and I, I would also say make clear, as we've been making clear for years, that rape isn't about sex, it's about violence. It is about control and, and violence. Um, and also that it also happens to men. For instance, rape in the military 
uh, which is a huge, huge problem. And if you haven't seen um, The Invisible War as a documentary about this, I, re I do recommend that you see it. It's, it's about 20% men. It has to do with dominating, humiliating, invading someone else's bodies. And the letters that I get that understand rape the best are from men in prison, who in the absence of females have been used as females. And they say, okay, now I, I understand. But we need the specific and the narrative, I think, in addition to the generality and the statistic. I would, thank you, Anna. I would now like to welcome Abigail Fields, a member of the class of 2014, to ask the next question. Hi. <laughs> Women's colleges are sometimes considered as anachronistic as feminism itself. What particular role, if any, do women's colleges or women's education play in today's equality movement? Mm. You know, one kind of education doesn't work for everybody and therefore we need many kinds of education. And it is crucial, crucial, crucial that we maintain women's colleges, that we maintain historically black colleges, um, you know, because especially people who have lived on the periphery need an experience at some time in life of being in the center. And, and it, it's... It's true, it's profoundly true on this campus. I feel the love and support and respect that you have for each other. It's a great experience just to walk here and get the vibrations. And it's also true in the converse because if we don't have that experience, we may attribute normal human failings to prejudice. You know, we, we, we need to be together to understand that not everything <laughs> Not every problem is attributed to bias. Some of it is, you know, just that we have to learn to listen to each other or whatever it is. But it, it's, it's terribly, terribly, terribly important. And as you know, a way disproportionate number of, of women achievers, of women in political office, especially also women in science and math, have come from uh, women's colleges. I'm very grateful to you and to my college of Smith College for hanging in there. Thank you, Abigail. I would now like to ask Bianca Medina, a member of the class of 2013, to ask the next question. Hello. <laughs> um, I'm, at the, I'm in the education program at Simmons, so I was wondering, in terms of education, what values, concepts, or ideals you think are most important to instill in our youth today? Well, I don't know. Oh, there's, you know, that's such a, that's like describe the universe and give two, two examples away. But um, I would say in most cases, not all, but in most cases, maybe the m most potent educational tool is to listen. You know, because people don't know they have something to say until someone listens to them. So if, if it can be um, a, a two-way street and if it can be as, uh, as much communal as possible. I mean, I've seen enormous changes take place in classrooms where all they did was uh, uproot the chairs or change the chairs and put them in a circle instead of, you know, like this and, and the teacher in the front or where the students were given responsibility for teaching someone else. So everybody becomes both a student and a teacher at, at some time. Um, and also, uh, and ultimately, and, you know, what, what are we studying? Are we studying something? I mean, when I went to Smith, I was reading Aristotle, who had the most atrocious things to say about women, and I was supposed to memorize it, and I did. You know, <laughs> so, no, no, nobody told me. Maybe you know there was an exception here. So, right? so we 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 do need to look deeply at what we are studying because earlier today I was quoting the valedictorian study, which some of you may know it was a 15-year um, longitudinal amazing study in which 
uh, male and female high school valedictorians were measured for 15 years and uh, uh, about their intellectual self-esteem. And the young men maintained their intellectual self-esteem and in the young women, by and large, it went down with every additional year of higher education because they were studying their own absence. So we need all those remedial courses. You know, we need women's history and African-American history and gay and lesbian and trans, you know, we, so eventually we'll have human history. It's very hard, it's very hard to maintain your uh, sense of, um, the power of your own mind and identity if what you're reading doesn't have you in it. If you know I mean. So the, the, the more we can do that, the better. And if, if it's not in school, improvise it. There, there was um, a woman in Alabama who, I mean, the school was so racist and the, I mean, the whole um, version of history was so profoundly based on the Confederacy. I mean, it was... <laughs> impossible, it was, it was in middle school. So she had, she started Saturday University and she, the kids loved it because it was called university and they, and they had different courses on Saturday outside the school and it really made a huge difference. So, you know, by any means necessary, I would say. Thank you, Bianca. It turns out that we have some extra time, and one thing that Gloria expressed interest in doing is having an open discussion with all of you. Um, so if you guys have a comment or a question for Gloria, can you please raise your hand, and we have people going around with the mics. Um, back there. It doesn't have to be for me. It can be for everybody here. You know. Okay, well, I'll, I'll just yeah. sort of direct it towards you. <laughs> what did she say? <clears throat> My name is Kate Phelps. I had the wonderful experience earlier today to speak to one of our emerging leaders programs. Uh, and one thing that I'm really curious about, if anybody would like to speak up to this, is this idea that men and su men, success and likability for men are correlated positively. And for women, it's the opposite. So the more successful we are, the more outspoken, the more willing we are to be driven, we are liked less. And there is fear associated with that. And I'm wondering if you have any mm -hmm. words of encouragement that would help people, especially in, in this time, in this age group, this, you know, mm -hmm. this crucial moment to really sort of push past that. Yeah, no, that's a very deep problem that you identify, and it happens at all levels. I mean, um, it's one identified by Sheryl Sandberg in her right. book, Leaning yes. In, and it's also one that affects Sheryl Sandberg, because it's the first time in my life I've ever seen some success be an impediment to giving advice. You know, the, only a woman, only in a woman would that happen, okay? So, the, the, because the, a lot of the critiques have said, well, she, have, what does she know? She's too successful, you know? She can't possibly talk to other women. I mean, well, anyway. So, <laughs> it, it is true, and it's true at all levels. I mean, um, Hillary Clinton, what, what, the minute she lost was instantly better liked. All of the polls went up. And it's equally unfair to men because men have to succeed to be liked or loved. It is just as unfair to men. It's horrific. So, you know, I think the, the, the most helpful thing I can think of, and maybe other people here have other ideas, is to remember that if you don't do what you want to do if you're not as successful as you could be or whatever form it takes and you are liked you are not being liked for yourself it has nothing to do with you it's like a big rabbit up here above your head <laughs> you know that that the like is directed at that uh, so uh, you know there's it, it it's not real it's not real and I would say one real thing is worth about 20 unreal things. Does anybody else have any suggestions? 
Well, of course, one of the functions and important things about a campus full of women is that you do support each other. You don't punish each other for success, right? Right. Hi, my name is Deborah Lebel, Simmons College, class of 2005. Um, I'm 30 years old now. I've been in the workplace eight years. I just got married. It's been very exciting, and then I felt like one day I, I hit a wall. I, I'm, I go on LinkedIn every day, and it seems like every day there's an article on LinkedIn, can women have it all? How do you balance career and kids? And I'm really getting sick of it, and I mean, because it's always about how do the women do it? How are they going to overcome the struggle? And I think it is so sexist, not just because they're saying that we have this problem, but because they're denying that men would have this problem too. Mm -hmm. And it, I, I don't know if anybody else is noticing this, but I mean, the more they're trying to help women, I think it's really hurting women. And Gloria, I'm wondering if you have any advice on how we can mm -hmm. start to turn the tide on this and really make it a conversation about men and women, mm -hmm. people who have careers, people who want to have a great marriage, people who want to have a great family, and it's not about gender. No, I utterly agree with you. I bet everybody here agrees. <laughs> it, it is a way of putting, of blaming the victim, and also, as a bonus, dividing women against each other by saying, you know, well, she has it all, so you can have it all, or can women have it all? I mean, if you have to do it all, you can't have it all. Nobody can do that. Not, not male, female. Uh, and that, the question is unacceptable, and I think, I'm beginning to think more and more should not be answered at all, unless it involves men as well as women, and social policy as well as personal choice. Because we, Otherwise, we're going to go right on being the only developed country in the world that does not have a national system of child care, that does not have family-friendly policies decreed by, to some extent, by the national government, that does not, I mean, we work longer and harder than the Japanese, who used to hold that crown. <laughs> you know, so, if, if somebody is only asking a question of, about children, Two women don't answer. Hi. Um, I'd like to say that you're such an inspiration to the staff of the Simmons Voice, scattered around. <laughs> And I wanted to ask what sort of female-specific challenges you yourself have met as a journalist. As a, as a journalist? Yeah. Oh, well, because of my age, there was a lot of, you know, um, a, just assignment craziness, you know I mean? Because, I mean, it's interesting to write about fashion, but I didn't know anything about fashion, you know? <laughs> or I would ask to interview the, politi the male politician, and they would give me the politician's wife. And... Um, and they would pay me less. I mean, Time Magazine paid me so much less for an article about the women's movement <laughs> that I complained to the editor, and he sent me a Gucci purse. <laughs> and so I went to Gucci and said, certainly you'll be willing to give me the money instead. And they said, no. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not nearly that bad anymore, um, but there are still profound differences when it comes to very important assignments, assignments that involve um, foreign travel, a lot of money. The same is true in the movie world. I don't have to tell you that, you know, that, that a, a, an untested or relatively untested male director is more likely to get a big budget movie than a tested female director. Um, you know, it's, it, it is still there. And we have to both 
protest it and support each other in protesting it. And, and sometimes it's really just consciousness. Sometimes people don't think about it. For instance, when I right now am raising money for candidates, the, uh, the same donor may give me less for the female Senate candidate than for the male Senate candidate without even thinking about it. It's like somehow we can get along on less. And <laughs> I hear not, I see nods here from Barbara Lee. That, but if you, in a nice way, name it. I mean, I, you know, we want, I want to speak to people as I would want them to speak to me. But, you know, it's really about, sometimes it is, is about consciousness. Uh, now, uh, writers have met this in all kinds of ways. Uh, Non-gender specific names, so they don't actually know <laughs> who you are. Uh, you know, it depends the tools that are available to you. But incidentally, while we're on this thing of, of paying and, and, and women, there's the Huffington Post doesn't pay writers at all, oh. male or female. That's why it's free. Uh, they pay oh. editors, but they don't pay writers. And me personally, I would not write a word for the Huffington Post, but I can, <laughs> I mean, I don't have to, so I'm not suggesting that, but think about it. Because even the Women's Media Center, which has no money, comparatively speaking, uh, pays several hundred dollars for a column, and the Huffington Post pays nothing, and the Daily Beast pays too. So a little collective action sometimes is helpful. What advice do you have for little girls who want to make a difference just like you did? Well, First of all, you have just done a great thing, which is that you have spoken up in it. <laughs> and, and just by your voice, you have reminded us of the little girl or boy who is inside all of us. You know, we're all like Russian dolls, I think and who we once were, right? Um, and other than that, I would just say, I, there are probably two things you already know, and I would just say to remember these two things. One is probably at some time in your life you have said it's not fair, right? And probably you have also said you are not the boss of me. <laughs> And, and other than that, other than that, I would just say do what you love. And you'll know what you love because you forget what time it is when you're doing it, because you would do it even if nobody told you to, or maybe even if they told you not to. You know? <laughs> do what you love, because there's a very, there's a unique person in here that has talents no one else on earth has. Thank you. I have a question, but before I begin, I have to say that was a perfect segue to something that I would like to note, because it's my Gloria Steinem story. I think that there is nothing more powerful in the world than a child and a book. In the summer that I was 14, I read Gone with the Wind, The Female Eunuch, The Total Woman, and The Happy Hooker. And I was the single most confused girl on the planet. <laughs> For those of you who have not read The Total Woman, that's the lovely housewife who says, wrap yourself up in saran wrap. So when your husband gets home, you say, oh, honey, you know, <laughs> lay out on the dining room table. And if you don't know what the female eunuch is, shame on you. Um, and everybody knows what going with the wind is. Um, but I was singularly spinning because I didn't know what being a grown-up girl meant. 
And the voice that changed that for me was you. And I will never forgive myself if I don't ask if I can shake your hand. My question is, because <laughs> there's a question, and thank you for this, and thank you so much for that. Please give me a sound bite for the young women to whom I speak who say, I'm not a feminist, I don't need to be a feminist, I am just myself, and it, that is what it is, and you know, feminists are radical, and I don't have to be that. Mm -hmm. And my brain practically explodes, because I want to say, you stand on the shoulders of regular women like you and you and you who became extraordinary leaders and have allowed you to be where you are. Mm -hmm. It's a mm -hmm. little radical for soundbite. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, give me a soundbite to no, answer I, that. I, I agree with you and I think it may be that the young woman doesn't really know what the word means because it has been demonized, you know. So if, you know, you give her the dictionary definition, you know, do you, it's somebody who believes in the full social, economic, political equality of males and females, she may well agree with that, right? Uh, it, it often rests with, you know, just, just not knowing what it means. Um, but, uh, and I was saying this afternoon that sometimes I feel impatient like you, you know, and I sort of want to say, well, you have a choice. You can be a feminist or a masochist. Those are the two. <laughs> <laughs> but um, <laughs> but I, uh, I, I think, the, I, I, let me put it this way. I don't think that gratitude ever radicalized anybody. So, I mean, I did not walk around saying thank you for the vote. I got mad on my own behalf. So I doubt, and based on my experience, that you're saying you're standing on the shoulders of other people, here's you couldn't be doing what you're doing if it weren't for them, probably won't work. We get radicalized on our own you know, concerns, as we always said in the 60s, right? So it, it, she's, it's more likely to come from questions. Do you feel as safe in the street, you know, as a young man your age? Do you feel you should be able to decide if you want to have children or not? Do you feel, I don't know, you know, whatever the question is. So that she sees it as supporting her uniqueness and her future. I, 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 I do think we get some, us, us older ones, sometimes here, here's what happens, I think, a little bit. We are so likely to have given our all without getting anything in return, you know, and sometimes even just getting opposition from our own families, that um, we now try to take, uh, to get gratitude from younger women. And I don't think that that works because it's like saying I walked 30 miles in the snow, <laughs> you know. <laughs> And it wasn't her fault, you know, that she, that she, we didn't get gratitude then, but rather to direct it towards her. What do you want to do? Listen to her so she knows that you care about that and get and make it a word that supports her uniqueness and her um, dreams.
Thank you. I had the privilege of hearing you speak at uh, the School of Management in the late 1980s. Uh, one of the first questions someone asked you is uh, about your own legacy. How would you want to be remembered? Um, you um, deflected that question by talking about the idea that women's history is basically buried, refound, rediscovered, buried again. Um, but tonight, 25-ish uh, years later, I'd like you to answer that question now. <laughs> if you See would, how please. things follow you. <laughs> about your own legacy, if you well, could speak I, to that. Thank you. Um, that's really hard, you know, and it, the, the, this is really my punishment, because I, when I, as an interviewer, I used to ask people <laughs> that question. I, I think I just, I want to be remembered as somebody who did my best to leave the world a little more fair and more connected and more uh, whole than it was when I got here. I mean, I guess that's it. <laughs> Although I have to say that the only thing that's ever been suggested for my epitaph on a tombstone was, at last she sleeps alone. <laughs> Hi, Gloria. My name is Sarah Galvez, and I'm a junior here at Simmons. I'm oh. <laughs> um, I had the privilege of meeting you earlier, and you were fantastic, one of my ultimate influencers in life. And I know a lot of people here at Simmons consider themselves activists and leaders or future leaders of the world, and you are both of those things. When did you know, what was the moment that you knew that this was your life's work? I put it off for a very long time, I have to say, because I, I just didn't have any, you know, in my generation, or, or at least speaking for myself, we were always living a temporary life. We were rebelling but hoping no one would notice, you know, so <laughs> we, I kept people, you know, I thought everybody had to get married and have children, so I kept saying, I'm doing that, I'm definitely doing that, just not right now, but I'm doing that. So. It really was the women's movement itself that made me realize that not everybody had to live the same way. And then I realized something even more profound, I think, which was that I was happy. You know, that I love, I love this work, and I love uh, my family of friends you know, who, who, who we all do it together and laugh and groan and carry on. I mean, it's, it's it's, it's, it's community, it makes everything else boring. <laughs> so um, I guess it was sometime in the life of Ms. Magazine because I kept saying when we started the magazine, I'd always been a freelancer. I'd never had a job, actually. I still have never actually had a job. And, and, <laughs> and I kept saying, okay, I'm doing this for two years, just two years, you know. Then 30 years later, right, I realized that this, this was my life, you know, and that I love it. I love it. So, unfortunately, I'm sorry. Um, unfortunately, that's all we have time for tonight, but I'd like to thank everyone who asked a question or submitted a, qu a question. We could not have had this discussion or Q&A without you all. Um, and it is now my pleasure to introduce Vanessa Poirier, the Vice President of the Class of 2013, to conclude tonight's event. Hello, everyone. So as we end this evening, on the behalf of the Class of 2013 Class Council, I would like to thank everyone who made this day possible. Thank you, President Drynan and the Office of the President for believing us and your support. Alumni Relations, thank you for your constant dedication and continued efforts throughout this entire process. Thank you to many, many other main supporters, including the, the Office of Student Life, Simmons Palooza, the Alumni Association Executive Board, the Marketing Department, and Archives. To those of you who helped make this day a reality, Simmons facilities, dining, conferences, 
Unico, and Public Safety. Thank you for your behind the scenes support and, the hard, and your hard work. Today could not have been possible without all of you. Thank you to the Student Government Association, Sexuality, Women, and Gender Center, and fellow class council for helping to transform this room for this evening. You must also thank all the organizations who pa participated in Gather for Gloria in the, this afternoon. Your work in our community, community continues to make the world a better place for all of us. A huge heartfelt thank you to the Office of Student Leadership and Activities, and especially to our advisor, Susan Chubb. Without you, our visions and successful events would not be possible. You have helped to foster our dreams and encourage us to put those dreams into action. Without you, we would not be able to do what we do. Thank you for making our last year at Simmons something we'll never forget. <laughs> to the 11 faces I see every Sunday night at 8 p.m. at our class council meetings, you are the very reason why I do this. <laughs> Thank you for always being there for one another. We did it. <laughs> we are leaving our mark, and tonight is a night I will always remember. Take in this moment. No matter what, where life takes us, we will always have these moments and each other for the years to come. Finally, I'd like to thank Gloria for being here tonight. This has been a dream for us to have you here and what you, what you spoke of tonight we'll always remember. So thank you all for coming and supporting us. Have a good evening, safe travels home, and we hope you enjoyed tonight. <laughs>